Did you really move to New York City with sixty dollars in your pocket? I did. I moved to New York. <laughs> I moved to New York with sixty bucks and two bags, and uh, I just knew that I wanted to become a better writer, and I was totally disappointed and disenfranchised by. Um, my feature film and how that went. So I was like, I'm just gonna go there and I'm gonna just be a great writer. And a friend of mine had an extra room in his house and so I stayed in his extra room and not to maybe like a year later, I had enough money to get my own place. What were in the two bags? <laughs> just clothes. Just clothes, all. okay, all right. So you wanna make sure you look good though. <laughs> That's I good. had these That's pumas. Good. I had these pumas <laughs> that I needed to throw away. They had holes in the side of them. The tread was worn down on them. But because those are the shoes that I had carried through my journey, I just never wanted to get rid of them. So it took me forever to get rid of those Pumas. But yeah, they were they were in one of those two bags. <laughs> I have something like that too, and it is. It's a reminder. Mm -hmm. it, it is. It, there, there's a history behind it. And, yeah. Yeah. Where you've been, you don't want to forget. You don't want to forget where you've been. And how did you travel? Did you travel by plane or yeah. you drove? Yeah, okay. well, I didn't. I didn't pay for the flight. One of my really good friends, like it was my time. It kind of wound down in Atlanta, where I, where I had produced my project, and I needed to get. I needed a place to stay. Essentially, I mean, you hate to say you're homeless, but essentially, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I didn't have a lease or money to get anything. And a friend of mine, he um, got a ticket for me. He said, "Hey, I have an extra bedroom." out here in New York, you're welcome to stay. And I went up there and I stayed in this place and quickly found a job and just tried to do what I needed to do to get my life back on track. What was that time like in the airport while you were waiting for the flight and checking in? I knew it was the right move. When I was in the airport headed to New York, I knew it was the right move, uh, but I didn't know why. Um, I was had always thought I would one day live in New York, but I had not made a single plan in my life to move to New York. And I just remember getting to LaGuardia and literally stepping off the plane and I knew that's where I was supposed to be. Nothing, nothing in me said otherwise. I knew that's where I was supposed to be. There was a film festival and, and a film. Was that any part of the motivation? Uh, moving to New York? Yes, the, I had done a feature film called Lesson Before Love and I had put so much work, time and effort into this feature. And this was kind of in the beginning when Ava DuVernay had done uh, Middle of Nowhere and she had done um, I Will Follow. So you started seeing like D. Reese doing these movies. There were all these micro budget black films that were like getting attention. Barry Jenkins had just done Medicine for Melancholy. So I'm thinking like all I have to do <laughs> like all I have to do is make a film. And if I make a film, it'll be significant enough for Hollywood to come calling. But I made this film. I got into this incredible film festival out in Hollywood. And I just knew something would manifest. I just knew it. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I just had my film and all these dreams. And they were just sitting there. And I was like, nothing's happening for me in Atlanta. My money's drying up. I need to just be better for myself. And I thought what was wrong was I wasn't as strong of a writer as what I needed to be. And so that's why I decided to go to New York because I'm like, the best writers are writing theater right there in New York. So I went there to just absorb and learn and grow. And how long had it been since you had finished that film? Um, it, it was the same year. It was the same year. So I did the film in 2000, at the very beginning of 2011. And then um, went on a film festival circuit. I only got into like four festivals. I only had enough money to submit for those four, so hey. <laughs> but um, yeah, got into those festivals and just thought like everything would change and nothing, nothing changed. Nothing at all changed. And it went from being what I thought was gonna be my calling card to like just another project. And I didn't know that you just have to keep doing your next project and not necessarily worry about the end game. And I was so focused on the end game that first time, which I think is really what set up all that anxiety and depression that I went through for a few years. Before you moved to New York, you had a job in, was it organ donation? Yes. Okay. And this was like a dream job. And it you was. were rising in the company mm -hmm. and you had plans. I don't know if you were saving up for a house or you were doing some things. Yes. So I got in this job. Um, this was right after Hurricane Katrina. And I got a job like right during that time. And so I never thought that organ donation would become a passion point for me. And it did. 
And so I worked a job and I was doing extremely well within the company. And then all of a sudden, they give me a new position, moved me to New Orleans in 21 days, they let me go. Like literally walk me out of the front door with security and change the code as soon as I get outside. And I never felt like that ever in my life. And I thought this was going to be my career job that I did in tandem with making films. But that's not what um, the design was, was about. Did you tell them that you were a filmmaker? They knew. So. <laughs> I know employers get nervous of that, employers which I don't understand Employers always why. get nervous. And I don't, know, I don't know why necessarily either, because I think people having an outside passion actually makes them better at their job because it gives you something to look forward to as opposed to just coming back home or going back to work on Monday. And so they knew. And um, they knew that I had done some plays. They knew that I had some things going on. But um, I just. I don't know if it was jealousy or envy or if I just didn't meet the corporate culture that caused me to get fired, but uh, I got fired and it took me a long time to recover from that. And so do you look back on it now that it was almost a blessing in some sense because your life has taken many turns? You went to New York, now you're here in LA. Yes, I think losing that job really was the, um, the impetus that was needed for me to kind of really start my career. Because beforehand, I mean, when you have the cushy job, when you have the money, your passions almost just inevitably take a back seat. And so when I lost that job, I had saved up this money to buy a home. But now, of course, you can't <laughs> buy a home with no job. And so I made my first feature film. And the way that I felt on that set, the moment that I said action, I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And that feeling is the feeling that has guided me throughout my entire career. Like when I have that feeling, I know that it's right and I know that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I look at it as an ultimate blessing at the time, but it did take me through a lot of emotional um, turmoil, losing something that I felt like I was supposed to have. Also too, I'm sure like losing trust in people, having been in a similar situation. I know you, you do, you lose faith in like a lot of different things, it's easy to get jaded. And so did, did, did there, were there things that helped you out of that? Um, I think it really just took time, to be honest with you, for me to get from that place of depression. And I didn't even know that I was like, even like depressed from having lost that job. I really honestly didn't know that. Um, and I never really had a clinical diagnosis, but now that I'm looking at it, I saw the state of depression means that you can't move either way. And so knowing that I was there for so long, I think it was really time and my filmmaking passion that really helped me kind of get out of that, that place. But I did lose faith in people. I did lose trust in people. I kind of still operate <laughs> just like that, um, having something taken away so violently. I knew the potential for that to happen again is always possible. So there is a part of me that is still extremely guarded, but I also know that um, you know, things are aligned in order the way that they're supposed to happen. Yeah. What advice would you give to another filmmaker on having um, a plan B or C or D, whatever? Because I think you know you, you had this plan for this movie, and then it happens to a lot of filmmakers where they think that's going to be the one to just quote put them on the map, and it it takes several other projects. Yeah, I think one of the most difficult things that happens to a filmmaker is for them to have a plan for their project and it not meet because then the mark of success becomes something that you can't control. Well, our job is simply now, I realize it's just to create. That's what our job is. And the universe will do what the universe is supposed to do. So now when I make projects or when I'm talking to people or giving any type of advice, I always say, just focus on creating. And everything that follows is what is supposed to happen, period, point blank. But if you, say, oh, I'm gonna do this project so that I can get into Sundance, and you made a project, which is the gift, that's the hard part, and you don't get into Sundance, then you feel like you weren't successful. And that's not the case. The success of your creativity was in making the project. Everything after that has nothing to do necessarily with you or the project. It's just how that is supposed to move throughout the world, and you really can't control that. So when you had this job, you were planning on doing these projects, maybe on the weekends or, you, you know, balancing it around the nine to five world. 
decided? Well, when I was um, working at job, I thought that I was going to write this script and then Spike Lee was going to call. <laughs> like, I literally thought one day he would just hit me on the phone like, do you still happen to have a script? And I'm like, yes, I do, Spike Lee. But uh, that's just not that's just not how it went. In order for me to have gotten to the place to start creating, I had to be in a space that identified this is the only opportunity that you have. So it had to happen that way in order for me to have created that project. And if it hadn't, I would have never found my purpose because I had not made a film before then. I had just been writing. I didn't even know that a, a short film existed. I went to a film festival in New Orleans and I thought it was for like feature films. And I'm like, of course, I love movies. And then I'm like, wait, did that just end in nine minutes? I'm like, wait, I didn't know it was a short film. And so that's how I got the thought to, oh, wait, I could take a little bit of money and I can do that. And so that's where it kind of came from. Where was this voice coming from telling you to make a short film? Wow, the voice, where was it coming from? Yeah, I think the universe speaks to us in so many different ways. And um, I didn't know, I always wanted to participate in the film industry, but I never knew how I could participate. I literally thought all I was gonna do was write films. And so when his voice came to me and said, you can make this, I think it came from universal alignment. And it was like the only thing that was facing me that I could do at the time. And um, I did it. I made the film. And I remember saying action. That's what it was. I said action on the film set. I didn't even know I was the director. I literally thought I was just putting the project together <laughs> so that the person who was filming it could do all that. And he was like, oh, no, 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 you're the director. And I was like, director, I am. I was like, what do you do? He said, you say action and cut. And so when I fir the first moment that I said action, I knew. It was the same voice that said, make this film. He came back and said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Do you think you take more chances now because of this situation that happened to you that is really life-changing? You think you take more risks now? I'm not afraid of anything because of losing everything. Because once you lose everything and you have nothing but your creativity, but yourself, you started to you, you start to redirect what's important to you. And before, I thought it was having a home. I thought it was having a car. I didn't know that the greatest value that I held on to was my creative abilities. And so now, when I had nothing, that's where really what gave me the the fearlessness not to not to lose anything. So now I can take those risks. I could go do point of, I can make this decision and make that decision because it's not bound by things. It's just bound by my internal purpose and what I'm trying to make happen. What was the first time you wrote a screenplay? What was that like? The first time I wrote a screenplay, it was in sheer anger. <laughs> I was in New Orleans and I was trying to act. And so I would go on auditions all the time and I would always read for the same parts and so I remember this one time going into this audition and I read this part and the casting director she's like oh that was really good she's like that was really good I just need you to make it a little more um black and I'm like okay okay so I actually read it the same way I did it the first time just to let her know like I did read it black <laughs> So I did it again, and she was like, oh no, good, 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 but one more time, do it again. I need it just to be more just like black. And I'm like, okay, and I read it the same way again. And she said, I don't think you're getting it. I said, well, can you demonstrate it? Can you show me like what this black, and of course she does this stereotypical, you know, homeboy, I guess black thing that no black people really actually do. <laughs> And so I remember leaving out of that audition and I said, I can write something much more authentic than these roles that I'm getting. And so I went and I sat down and I wrote this screenplay about three actor friends who wanted to come to Hollywood and the challenges of them making their career happen as actors. And within it, I gave all the actors so many different roles to play to show that you can write an array of different things and nothing is necessarily defined by your race. So that was the first screenplay, it was called In Between Dreams, that I ever wrote. 
And what what was the role that you were always going out for? Like, was it? I mean, it was just... always thug number three. I always read for thug number three, thug number four. Somebody named Mumbles. It was always <laughs> that type of like stereotypical role. And this was in the like the two thousands, you know. So it's not like it was you know, back in the 80s. And it was a lot of those stereotypical roles because a lot of those um, doing that era that was coming out of like the Love Jones era, the Love and Basketball, where it was like a lot of black romantic comedies, but now they were heading into the direction of doing more hard edge films. So there were a lot of thug type of roles that they wanted me to audition for. And I did, and I never got any of them because I don't, I don't make a good thug. <laughs> And these were all in Louisiana or Georgia? Louisiana. Okay. Yep. Louisiana. And then there was a lot of auditions there? There's a lot of auditions. So part of the tax um, credit that they give to um, the productions is you have to have so many speaking parts for local talent. And so those were the roles. And that's why they were written so thinly is because it really wasn't part of the production. It was just what they had to write in order to get those tax credits. If you had five minutes to teach someone how to write a screenplay, what would you tell them? Start with character. Start with character. I think the most important thing that you can write a screen a screenplay is about just an amazing, amazing, amazing character. Um, I know when I construct or engineer a character, I always start with some of the flaws that kind of exist within myself that I know need to be healed or need some type of attention. And so I use screenplays really as a way to like kind of heal some of those wounds that I have, which gives most of my work very dramatic feel. But um, I would definitely say start with an incredible incredibly rich character and then with those characters you can build in really really incredible storylines because sometimes one character may not go in this movie that you want they may really belong in like another production um, but I always say start with characters because that's what movies are all about really really great characters and you wrote a lot of plays as well right yeah, so plays have been something that I've been writing since I was a kid. I never even thought that it was possible to stage. I just, I grew up in a very small town in Arkansas that didn't have any type of theater or anything. So I used to just write them just to write them. But professionally, I didn't really start to really engage until I moved to New York and I just started writing as many different plays, short plays, long form plays, one acts, just as much as possible to really train my, um, my skills in that arena. So what's the difference for me? Forgive me, I don't know too much about um, stage plays and, and writing them. But what's the difference in terms of when you start writing a stage play versus a, a film? So the primary difference is um, between writing a stage play and writing a film is with a stage play, you're really trying to really work towards telling your thesis. And your stage plays is going to be a lot more narrative driven as opposed to a film, which is, a, is more picture driven. So when I sit down and write a play, I'm thinking about what I want to say. When I sit down and write a movie, I'm thinking about what do I want to show. And you can have an entire scene play out on film with no dialogue, but you can't have an entire scene play out on the stage with no dialogue. Dialogue is much more of the driving force, but both come with a lot of the same elements of strong characters, strong plot. Um, as little exposition as possible. A lot of the techniques are the same, but the applications among the two are different. Do you have a favorite play that you've written? Like a character that you really love? Yeah, I have several characters. Probably my most dramatic and gut-wrenching character that I've wrote, and his name is Eve. And so I wrote this play based on the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, but I switched the genders. So Eve is a guy, and his girlfriend's name is Amy, which is a play <laughs> on the word Adam. And the piece is called Unholy War. So he's probably my my favorite character that I've ever written because he's so fragile. And I think in a lot of ways, I have some of the fragility that he has, but I don't, I'm not allowed to express that fragility. And he is in the chorus of the play. And some of the doubts and the fears and the um, things that he goes through are some of the same experiences that I'm continuing to kind of work through myself. So he's by far my favorite character that I've ever written on a, on a, in a play. Interesting. And especially, too, you're so strong looking and, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't see you as being afraid of anything. Sure. And to allow that, because I know for so many men, that's not OK to express that. And right. It's, um, I mean, even black men, we're just not allowed to show any type of weaknesses or softness because 
our culture um, over time has calcified us inside of this manhood that we're supposed to, to represent and that is emblematic for us. So even for me as my own type of creator, I have a much more um, delicate edge to the way that I write dialogue. It's you know a little bit more poetic. It's not as hard edge that I know as a lot of people wouldn't necessarily expect. And so that's what I really love about that piece. And I think others like about it is this like they get to see a black man in a way that they've not really seen him before, where he presents strength, but he's really fragile and afraid. And going back to that audition. Yeah. They didn't want you to show that fear. Probably. No, no, not not at all. They want when she said when um, the in the audition, the woman kept saying, "Make it more black." She was saying, "Be stronger." That's what she was really asking me. She was like, "Have more rhythm to the way that you speak. Um, be more forceful in the presence that you have," which does, which is representative and indicative of black men. But at the same time, you can also take those same lines that you were given and do them in another way that is more colorful than the experience that she necessarily was trying to give me. And that's what I was trying to do, present a more colorful way of um, viewing that character. What makes a great story? I think what makes a really, really great story is deep down finding the humanity in the character. I really do. Um, any Mad Max Fury to The Color Purple, some of the best movies that have ever been created, the one thing that anybody connects with them is their humanity. You take this really big idea, but you make it really, really human. E.T., very, very human. Um, anybody could see what Luke Skywalker was going through. <laughs> you know, It is to find the humanity inside of a character. I think that's the greatest stories that are told. So you grew up in a small town yes. in Arkansas. Did you go to a movie theater? Because I know certain small towns, they, they have one, but it's like miles away. And yeah, so I very seldom went to movies growing up. We didn't, we didn't have a movie theater in our local uh, city, but we did have a blockbuster that was across town. Ooh. And so we grew up every Friday or Saturday going to the blockbuster, getting three or four tapes, VHS tapes, and, and popping them in and watching those movies. So while I didn't have a big screen, I did have a screen, and that's how I was able to really um, admire the, the film industry. And would you get excited going there? Because I would, like, trying to choose something that wasn't on the wall that had 50 uh, It was the best experience. <laughs> Blockbuster was the best experience, because remember, it was the smell of popcorn right when you walked through the front door. And they had on these blue button downs. And I wanted to work there so bad so I could get movies for free. And I must have applied like four times. I never got hired. <laughs> I never got hired at the local Blockbuster, but it was like our favorite. It was our favorite thing to do on like Fridays and Saturdays was to go get a movie from Blockbuster. I used to have a crush on the guy that worked there. So Did I would go really? in there a lot, yeah. Did you ever speak to him? Oh, no, but he took his, um, the roller thing, you know, they had the little, yeah. like, and he did it by my feet, and I was like, that's a sign. <laughs> he likes me. <laughs> and it was a sign. And then he left to go to college, and I was like, um, yeah, you know the guy that used to work here? And they're like, oh, yeah, he doesn't work here anymore. And uh, I was just, but anyway. That's all right. But yeah, Blockbuster, great, great memories. Yeah. yeah. How do you get to a character's emotional truth as a writer? I used to really struggle with finding characters' emotional truths. And the reason why that was is because I had not found my emotional truth. Um, when you're in the hamster wheel of trying to make content and all you're doing is creating and you're not living, it's hard for you to really connect to yourself. And so um, after I got to New York and I really kind of started to settle my life, I started to travel a lot more and make sure that I started to have experiences and I started to engage in my own personal growth. And so then when I found my own personal growth and who I was, I was able to, in, in an interesting way, tap into that emotional truth for a character. And that emotional truth for me is defined as what the character wants to truly believe about himself but nothing in the world is saying this is such. So for instance, a young filmmaker who really wants to be a filmmaker, but their universe is telling them that you're not a filmmaker. That is their emotional truth, that they want to be a filmmaker. And I think the journey of a, of a story, whether it's a short story or a film or a play, is how to get that character to believe in the truth that's already beating in their heart. So that's how I think that you get to a character's emotional truth is to find out what it is 
inside of them that really gets their blood moving, that gets their heart um, rate up, that gets them, gives them purpose to get out of the bed. That is what their emotional truth is. So the world is telling them they're one thing, but that's not what they feel inside. That's not what they feel inside. And for many of us, that's that's the reality. <laughs> you know, we're like wanting to build this business, but the world is saying you don't have the credit score, or you're in the wrong city to do that, or you're not capable of doing that. And then you to be able to overcome all of those eyes to get what you feel that you're supposed to have is where I think the story really is. Are there certain films that really hit home for you that do that? One of the one of the stories I think is Moonlight that does that beautifully because his ultimate emotional truth is he deserved to be loved, that he was worthy of love and belonging. And where he was gonna get that, Black didn't know. You know, he just didn't know where he was gonna get that from. And then you see, especially when he gets to the third act, he's so calcified from the world that he has quarantined himself off. All he does is work out and he does all these drug deals in order to make money. Again, a very dangerous way to exist because he had come through the prison system. But then when he meets up with the guy at the very end and he starts to break down that you are worthy of love because he saw somebody cook for him in a very loving way. He saw somebody have a conversation with him. So I love Moonlight as one of the greatest examples of a character finding their emotional truth, even if it was just subtle and at the very end. What about a play? Yeah, so my favorite play um, that illustrates emotional truth would probably be um, the Mountaintop by Katori Hall. She did a play that's about um, Martin Luther King and Kamei, which is um, a woman who was working in the hotel that he was staying in. And this is the night before his murder. And so the emotional truth that um, Martin Luther King was trying to come to in that piece is, I'm prepared to die. Like I'm ready for this death. But again, the, when he shows up into this hotel room, this woman is talking about how much he's needed, how much he's leading these organizations and how much how important he is to the movement, which tells him that he's not necessarily done here. So to see that exploration in the course of that, which was a two hour, two person play, which was phenomenal, again, was another way of me being able to see how someone gets to their emotional truth that was totally different from the way that it was done in like Moonlight. And sorry, it is based on a real life character? That Martin happened. Luther King, yeah. No, but at the, the, uh, the hotel, yeah. No, so she's totally oh. fictionalized. It's a fictionalized example of what he experienced the night before. And it is a stellar piece of theater. Interesting. It wow. is stellar. Yep. Wow. So he knew, he knew it was coming he knew. because the COINTELPRO and all the different things. That he knew. Were I think you, you always know. I think you always know. I think you know when it's time to move on. I think you know when it's time to stay. I think you know when it's time to deal with something that you don't need to really want to deal with. I think the universe always tells you those messages and those signs. Or in uh, Martin Luther King's case, when it was time for him to die. I think he knew. I think we always know. What ruins a story for you? Inauthenticity. Is that how you say that? Yeah. <laughs> <I> think, yeah. <laughs> when, when you know that it's not authentic, that is what really just ruins uh, a film or a story for me. When you know this is not the exact example of what this person would have done, felt, or truly believed. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just takes, it always just seems to take me out of the piece is when I, when I, when I see it's not authentic. Is it the acting or is it the writing, how the character is portrayed? I think it's a little bit of both um, at times. Um, I recently saw a play on Broadway where a woman was dealing with a very hard situation as far as um, her son and trying to figure out where he was and how he was. But I could also tell that the story wasn't authentically written. It didn't come from an authentic place. Um, I think the actors did a phenomenal job with the material that she was given, but I feel like they were trying to tell a story as opposed to letting the story come from within. Um, I think all of us get stories all the time and we want to go out and just tell those different stories. But I think the ones that resonate the most, they come from a place of authenticity. Not saying it necessarily has to be your story, but it has to just be authentic. And if it's authentic, people will connect with that. Right, there's always, I mean, especially now, there's a, de a debate on can someone really tell a story 
uh, about struggle or whatever if they haven't really lived it. Yeah. You know, especially no. if they've lived the total opposite. Right. Right. But the reality, because I kind of faced that with a recent project that I had done where I didn't I wasn't I didn't have the same um, experience as the protagonist of the series. So I was kind of challenged on it in some ways. But there is a such thing as a human experience. Right. And once you're able to find that human experience, um, everybody's dealing with the same things. We're all dealing with loss. We're all dealing with grief. We're all dealing with joy. We're all dealing with love and we're all dealing with it in varying ways. And so the difference between something being inauthentic and um, um, not well purposed, which that happens where people try to tell a story that they're not doing it is it ain't come from a very human place. But if you come from a human place, people will always be able to see the authenticity. Waves is a great example of that. The filmmaker is white, but the story is black, but it resonates. Um, the last black man in San Francisco, the filmmaker is white, the protagonist is black, but it relates because it's an authentic human story that anybody can buy into and believe in. Yeah, I really love that movie. I hope it gets nominated. Yeah, I hope it does too. I really, I think it was a special piece of theater. I hadn't cried in the theater in such a long time, but just to know, because I've had that experience of like a friendship that just has run its course, and to see their friendship fall the way that it, it was just beautifully executed. The cinematographer was amazing. Right, and they both, um, you know, the one character had more of a stable home life, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they tried to kind of take him in, mm -hmm. but I think he knew like. I don't really belong here. Yeah. And I know you're trying to make it feel like I belong here, but I don't. I don't belong here. And so it was about place, it was about belonging. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to give it away for anybody who hasn't seen it, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful film. It was an exciting piece of work. Yeah. It really was. I hope it I hope it gets some kind of uh, recognition. Notoriety. Yeah, something. Me too. You know, it's, it's too. hard when a lot of stories like that just kind of just get shelved. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, that's why we need independent cinema. You know, it's when I go to. Do you go to a lot of independent theaters? Oh, I still do all the time. Still do. Still do. I'm still committed to that process because that's where I am. I'm an indie. I'm an indie I'm a filmmaker. I'm not in the studio system, and in a lot of ways, I, while I regard it greatly, I'm not sure that that's where I'm supposed to be just yet. I'm supposed to be in the studio system because the independent system makes the most sense to me. I um, love having control over my stories and my ideas and to be able to accomplish those ideas in the most authentic way possible. Right, and I think for I, for me, I don't know, maybe for you too, but those are the stories that resonate with me the most. Yep. Are those indie stories, not the studio ones. Yep. Where no one claps when they get up and they, yep. and okay, you know, time to go to grandma's house now or where, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm just saying like, it's it's just a pit stop in between where I think people that go to independent cinema, it's to feel, really feel something. It's to experience it. be affected by it. Absolutely. And to have a conversation with a total stranger afterwards. Absolutely. That you wouldn't normally talk to. Absolutely. That's absolutely the case. Absolutely. Right, and I hope, I hope that doesn't go away because I know those theaters are in danger sometimes because there's not enough money behind them. But. Yeah. We understand you watch a lot of Razzie nominated films. Mm -hmm. What's the reason behind that? Well, so years ago, um, I was writing and 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 writing. And one of my really good friends, she's a playwright also in New York, she says, do I see you writing all the time? She's like, but what have you read? And I was like, I don't read plays. <laughs> and she was like, you're not gonna be great until you watch read the good stuff and the bad stuff. You have to watch it all. And so that didn't even make sense at the time until I just decided to go into the, um, the uh, playwriting bookstore in New York and I just would pick up plays and it wouldn't matter if I knew the playwright or not. And then you would start to see the difference between a really well-constructed play and one that is not as well-constructed. And so the Razzies, I like to make fun of films who aren't the best um, that's out there and so I watch the good stuff and I also make sure that I watch the bad stuff to make sure that I'm constructing narratives in a more progressive and nuanced way. Do you ever watch the bad stuff and say this isn't actually bad and sometimes the good stuff this isn't I'm just like not impressed with the story? Not really actually most of the time if it's widely kind of seen as bad I kind of find it to be bad. Do you? Okay. <laughs> you well. see why. All right. 
And um, what I've recently started to do was, because the, the reality is even to make a bad film takes an incredible amount of work. It really does. And so I don't necessarily go in now to judge work, but to rather glean whatever the artist is trying to, to, to get me to see from what they're trying to say. Whether they're successful at it or not, that's not really for me to judge, like I used to judge in the past, but rather to just enjoy the experience for what it is. Um, but I do find, like as you say, sometimes the movies that everybody just say are just so phenomenal and so good, it just doesn't resonate with me as much because I think that in the um, approach to try to appeal to everyone, you appeal to no one. <laughs> as opposed to trying to appeal to someone and allowing others to participate in that as well. So I think that's where kind of the difference probably is. And for your your first film, you cast actors that you knew, is that right? Yes, yeah, so I knew um, Kim Brown. He was somebody that I knew. I didn't know the ladies and I didn't know the other guy that was Peyton Houston. I didn't know them at the time, but I knew them. They were kind of swirling around from other people that I knew. And I knew, okay, I can only have four characters. I can only afford a couple people, <laughs> a couple of dollars a day. And that's, that's what we did. So we did a very small four person cast and they were pretty much in every scene of the entire movie. And what locations did you get? Like, I got the locations that I could get. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's not funny, but it is funny because when you don't have any money, you can go right high end, you know, high end bar with full with patrons and a waitress walks up and does this. But then when you're the reality of it, you can't afford that location. So I think what I would have done differently um, than what I did now is I would allow each scene to kind of take place anywhere and then whatever locations you find that made sense in those regards would make sense in those regards. And you do it like that. So then you're just going and looking for whatever locations allow you in as opposed to trying to be so specific and not being able to accomplish it. Because I think even in my first film, like every restaurant that we were in, Nobody was there because we couldn't afford background. <laughs> we just couldn't afford it. So nobody was there. And we tried to make it like, oh, nobody's there because they're not supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, but I would, I would definitely adjust how I would do it, especially if you don't have money. If you don't have money, you just provide the framework. And then you go let the universe kind of tell you, this is where you can film, this is where you can film, and then put it in those locations or a location that you already know that you can get. Forgive me, how much did you spend on your first film? If you so don't my first know. film, I did it for $45,000. Yep, we did it on $45,000, which made sense because Ava DuVernay had just done a film. I think it was uh, I Will Follow. She did it for $50,000. And so I'm thinking like, oh, we're right in line with what they're doing at this time. And again, it was a very insulated, isolated film. that She was pretty much at her aunt's house. The entire film it had Shelley Richardson Whitfield in it. But Ava is like a master at being able to market and get her voice out there. You know, we didn't have those same resources and we were from Atlanta, so nobody nobody really cared about our project. It's okay. And it was a feature, right? It was a feature, it was a little bit too long. And I remember also when we went into the first cut, I was bored out of my mind for the first 26 minutes of the film. So the first 26 minutes of the film, I totally cut out of the project. Uh, because again, I didn't know how to necessarily get into story in that way and I didn't have a mentor to kind of like guide me. And so I think that's another thing. People cannot be afraid to lose things in the process because in losing those 26 minutes, I think I really gained a solid one hour and 30 minute film. But if I was trying to get to this two hour time frame that I was initially trying to do, we would have lost a lot of audience from the very beginning. And you cut that in when you started editing it? Yes, I remember my first time watching it and I was just like, this is not interesting. And even now when I go back and I read that screenplay, I realize what I was doing on those first 26 minutes and why it wasn't interesting. And so now I approach stories with a little bit more vigor and heart from the very beginning and I don't try to meander as much as I had initially done. Were you warming up 
in that 26 minutes? What, what do you think it was? I was still trying to learn the craft of screenwriting. So um, at the time, I was just writing from a place of, this is what everybody wants to say. And this is how they want to say it. And this is a cute way in order for them to be able to say it. But I didn't understand the craft and the technique towards opening the film. And that your first opening image has to be a story itself. That's why my first film was so riddled with dialogue and not riddled with emotion and images because I was all about what I had to say as opposed to what I had to show. Where fast forward now, like I'm working on another feature film, which I cannot believe I'm doing, but 10 years later, I'm doing another feature film and everything is image based. So my first scene, I'm drawing what the image is. And then I'm deriving what has to be said within that for the story to truly live. Like what information does the character, does the audience have to have in this moment? That's a complete different approach from what I did in the very beginning. I was very much writing plays um, on film and trying to film a play as opposed to making a movie. That 45000 uh, forgive me if this is too personal, uh, but that was meant for you to put a down payment on a house, right? <laughs> Sorry. I <laughs> wish. Oh, okay. No, that actual that wasn't, 45 huh? was for me to make a feature film. So we got a couple of investors ah. um, to give. One gave 25 another gave 10 and another gave 10 And then the last 10 was kind of like piecemeal together. But that mo money was literally sitting there for us to actually make a film. We had initially budgeted 150000 but we never got there. And I just decided to go ahead and make the film, which you shouldn't do. You should only make a project when you have the financial resources to truly support it. Other than that, you will just be frustrated as I was for that entire year. So if you could have changed things, you would have waited? I would have waited. I would have waited. I would have gotten uh, pers more perspective on the screenplay. I would have sent it off to get coverage for people to tell me what was wrong with it, what was right. I didn't know that was a thing you could do at the time. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. I kind of feel like I didn't cast the right people that I wanted to necessarily cast, even though I cast who I was supposed to cast. So I would have made a lot of decisions um, differently, but I'm glad that I had that experience because had I not, I wouldn't know how to be as savvy as I am with the budgets that I do have now. Do you think it was because you just wanted to make a movie so badly? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to transform my career. I was in a place where I hadn't really had, a, I hadn't had a place to stay. I hadn't had a consistent income for quite a, quite a long time. And I knew that if I was able to make a piece that really connected, that somehow Hollywood would come calling. And it just didn't, it didn't happen like that. And so I really decided I would never make another feature film ever again after that experience. And even the experience of going through what I went through as far as distribution was concerned. And, you know, getting picked up in Redbox Nationwide and getting a couple of dollars for it, even though the, the distrib distributor made thousands. You know, so to have those experiences, to go to all those things really put me in a place where I'm like, I want to make films, but I don't want to be a part of this business, right? This juggernaut that is Hollywood. But here I am, still participating. <laughs> Knowing that you maybe rushed into making your first feature film and you have a lot of things that you would have done differently. Do you think it's better that you did that rather than still be talking about making that feature film 10 years out, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, no, I, it was the right decision to make. Like I don't, I don't fault, the, you know, I don't regret having done the film. I, it was really exciting. I still watch it every now and then. I'm like, oh my God, this is actually like a good little film. <laughs> I'm still excited about it. But what I think that the realization that I have come to is in order to cook the meal that you need to cook, you need to have all the ingredients on the table. And so now I'm taking a much more realistic approach for but with budget, I'm taking a more realistic, I'm still not in the million dollar, you know, range, but I am at the place where I know there's a certain level of professionalism that I need, a certain level of talent that I need. Um, and so to approach work now with a little bit more savvy and making sure I have those ingredients is a little bit more important, but I'm glad that I cooked the film that I cooked the first time. I am, I'm very glad that I did that because I wouldn't be here had I not gone through that process. 
So the, the, the film wasn't burnt, but it, it could have used maybe more spice. It didn't rise. Spice. It was oh. a cake that didn't rise, but okay. that was still edible. Okay, okay, yeah, that's still good. You can still eat it out of the pan. You can still eat it out of the pan, but you can't serve it to the masses. Okay, right. You know, I mean, as metaphorical as we could be, you know, it just didn't rise to the level that I felt like it could have risen to with a little bit better ingredients that I needed to have along the way. But it was a great, I think it's still, I still think it was a great project. What prompts you to watch it over and over again? Sometimes you just need to be reminded. Um, I think a lot of times with creators, because we're always focused on what's next, we forget what we've done. And I think when you forget what you've done, you lose sight of where how much you've grown. So like I can watch my films and I see elements in my first film that are gonna be in my new film that I'm gonna be doing. Like I still do the color coding. Like I still uh, approach um, scenes kind of in a similar way, but a more progressed way than I used to in the past. I still wanna throw these little nuggets of life inside the dialogue. I still do some of the same elements. So it's nice to see that what I made was a true um, depiction of who I am as a creator and as a person and but but it also lets me know the resources and the skill set that I was at that time so sometimes you just have to be reminded that you have made progress you have to see where you've been to be able to recognize where you're going I heard you say in a talk that you gave somewhere in New York it was a great talk and you said you have to know that you want to be part of this industry do you think people really have to know or can they just kind of like you know, try it out and see where it takes you. Is it okay to be on the fence about it? Or do you really have to know that you want to be in this industry? Well, I liken it to um, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Either you're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro or you're not. You can't decide the day before climbing the mountain that you're going to climb the mountain. That's how people die on the mountain. But if you know this is what your actual goal is, then you have to put the work in to prepare yourself for it. And a lot of that is um, nothing that can be taught in a film school, um, nothing that can even really be learned on Film Courage. It is an actual experience that you have to have to understand who you are, how you are, because the hows really matter in this approach. Um, of making films and being part of this industry. So I think people have to know is 100% what they want to do. But there's also a little bit of beauty in the, the bliss of ignorance because had I known all of what I would have had to suffer to get to this very moment that I am now, I would not have done this. No? I would, no, I wouldn't have done it. I didn't know that there was so much suffering um, as, that's part of a, a creative journey in the industry that I find to be so beautiful because it's that hard. It's literally climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. But I know how to scale Mount Kilimanjaro now because I've had so many experiences and I've been training for so long. So I feel like now I'm in LA, I'm ready to be a part of this industry. I know who I am as a creator. I know how to work with other creatives. I know how to take studio notes now. <laughs> like I know the difference between a television directing and film directing. Like I understand these things now and I needed all those small experiences to get exactly where I am right now. But if I had the foresight, I wouldn't have done it because it's been that difficult. What do you think you would have done? I'm not sure. I think I would have been a teacher. I love to like teach and like share knowledge and information. And I think that's what my films are. They're just really beautiful lessons, you know, that people get to see and participate in. So I probably would have been a teacher. And I think I would have been, I would have been an okay teacher. Yeah, I think you would have been because yeah. we saw you um, giving a, like a lecture to a group of filmmakers. Yeah. Yes. And you know, you had high energy and just yes. you know were willing to admit where you went wrong and yep. different things and, and um, but I just wondered if you'd ever envisioned what would have happened if you knew how hard it would have been. I don't know. I think, it, uh, uh, again, I just used the Mount Kilimanjaro thing. I, don't, I, I think even people who have successfully scaled the mountain still didn't realize it would be as difficult as what it was. And I think to still get to the top and not recognizing how difficult of what it was is where the joy comes in. Right, that's what makes the hero's journey. Because I'm on my own hero's journey, trying to come from nothing to make myself relevant in an industry that I am extremely passionate about and that I love. So, yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if I could see it. If I could see it, I wouldn't have done it. Does your family ever call you to come home? 
No, they don't. They knew calling me to try to come back to Arkansas would be totally futile. <laughs> it would be a futile <laughs> call. They would never make that call. And there was a lot of trepidation for them. I mean, to live in Arkansas is to live in such a safe space. You know, it doesn't take much to own a home. Um, there's a community of people that already support, that already love. But the reality is the industry that I want to be a part of exists in New York and it exists in LA. So I had to make the decisions to come to come out here and I'm glad that I did. Have you ever been tempted to compromise your values? I have not been tempted um, to compromise my values because for me, I've been leading the effort of my productions. Um, they've been my productions. And so I haven't had to run against any type of um, executives or executive producers that have asked me to compromise any of my values. And to be honest, and I'm really kind of thankful that you asked that question because it makes me reflect on why I got into this industry and to begin with and what I didn't think was possible. I didn't think it was possible to get to where I am without compromising my values. And I remember when I was like 20, 22 years old, I came to LA with a script, that script that I had made between you and me that I thought Spike Lee was going to pick up. I came to LA and I was here for six weeks. And I recognized in order for me to be successful, I'm gonna have to compromise my values. So I immediately went right back home because I was like, this is not for me, which fast forward these few years later, I'm here and I haven't had to do any of that. So I'm really grateful. Without naming any names or exact situations, what did you feel you would have to do and what, how would that be compromising? Well, the thing that I learned about LA when I first got here is the is how the community kind of works here. Um, I'm a very like um, spiritual person. I'm not really religious. I'm not. I'm I'm very much an empath, and in order to not be affected by those energies, I can't be around a lot of people. And I saw that when I first got to LA, you have to find a crew of people to kind of run and to kind of hang out with. And so I I could see myself being in circles where people were talking negative about other people in order to make themselves feel better, and that's not me, you know. Um, the you know kind of drugs things that kind of was going on and I'm like that's not that's not me either like I don't judge anybody for what they do but it's not necessarily who I am but I'm also not like a religious zelo <laughs> you know I'm like a little bit in between just a guy that wants to eat good food and go to the movies <laughs> like that's all I want to do and so I just kind of could see a lot of those influences happening and a lot of those influences taking root and I was like okay I'm not ready for LA but now that I'm back while I still see some of those same things again, I'm able to address it a little bit different than what I was in the past. I have the strength now to say no. And plus you have a body of work. Yeah. So at that time when you came, you had just a few scripts? Just a few scripts. Uh -huh. Just a few scripts and a whole lot of um, um, naivete. <laughs> I really did. Right. I really did. I had no idea how the film industry in LA works. And in this past year that I've been here, while I don't, I can't say I'm like an expert, I've really been able to see and witness how the industry works. And it makes a lot more sense now. And I see how I can navigate through it. And plus, you know, you can put a production together. Yep. You did it. Yeah. So whether you were totally happy with the project, the outcome mm -hmm. is one thing, but you know, you can get people together, you can get resources. So I'm sure that exudes a different energy so maybe then they know okay well this guy i can't totally i can't pull the wool over his eyes no He's already... not at all uh when i got here so one of the first things that happened when i got here was uh, people different production companies would hit me up for different meetings and i remember having this one meeting and this guy he was talking really quick really really quick very gregarious um, had a very attractive personality, very attractive personality. And he was talking about like, I love, send me your script. I will want to look at your project. I sent him over just like a deck of what I wanted to. He was like, this is the perfect project. And then he starts talking about um, that he can do these certain sales on the film prior to just to get started. All he needed was like $15,000. And I, I know when I was younger, not that I had 15,000, but if I would have had it, I knew I would have given it to him. 
But now I'm able to note the business and I know that I don't have to give you $15,000 for me to go get money for my feature film. But again, you start to see these characters and you start to see how people conduct themselves and know like, oh, that's not what I want to be associated with. And so I was easily, I was easily able to say no this time where when I was younger, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So he wanted that upfront money to yep. take on your film? To take on my film project um, and then um, to get funding for it. But I just never heard of that structure, that finance structure that he was saying. So it made sense that this was more of a scam than it was an honest reality of someone who just wanted to work with me. Almost like um, modeling agencies that'll take you on yep. if you use their photographer and these different things and yep. you pay this upfront. So it was almost like that, like the was, project hadn't finished or wasn't even made? No, the project wasn't made. It was just a screenplay at the time. Um, I still have that screenplay, but he read the screenplay, said it was incredible, which of course was part of the the manipulation and wanted money, wanted about fifteen thousand dollars to get just to get started. And then he said, you know, he's he's able to work a deal within like six to eight weeks. And I'm like, none of what you're saying makes any sense. And so you were 21 and you went back home yeah. with that knowledge. Did he try to call? No, this happened this year. Oh, oh that I got see. happened this oh, year. Wow, okay. If that had happened to me when I was 21, oh, I would have given him whatever I had. Because oh. I would have thought this is this is how you this is how you make a film. This is the business. And it's not the business. And I know the business because I've studied the business act, you know, more appropriately. So yeah, this just happened like maybe like six months ago. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my bad. I thought oh, this okay. was Okay, and so how did that make you feel, knowing like you you could have been taken advantage of, but you knew better? Like, how does that? It made me feel so accomplished. <laughs> it really did. The one thing that I have learned how to do is say no, and that's sometimes I have to say no to myself. <laughs> like, hey, I want to write this certain project. No, that project isn't for you. It's not authentic. Oh, great. And so now I'm able to flex that muscle. So it was nice for me to look him in his eye and tell him, no, thank you. It was it was empowering. And again, I wouldn't have gotten there had I not done my feature, had I not done my digital content, had I not gone through these scrapes and these bruises to know what feels right and what feels wrong and have the power to be able to, to say no. After you made your first feature film, you stopped making movies for Yes, a while? I did. I said I would never make another feature film again. I just was done. I couldn't do it. Because I didn't know what, why this one filmmaker could make a film that wasn't the best film ever made and continue to make progress. And then I could make a film and nobody care. I didn't understand that. But I also at the time didn't understand the business, you know, and the business of visibility, the business of associations, of knowing people. You know, I didn't have any of that. I was just this one, this young man creating these films in my own lab and not that many resources to get about into the world. So I had a very small um, approach and I just knew I was like, this is too hard and I'm not going to do it. So I just decided to just become a playwright in New York as opposed to keep making a film. So you still wanted to be creative. I wanted to create, but I wanted to do it in a place that was a little more safe, a place where I could like have regular things like, um, afford a cup of coffee. <laughs> I wanted to be able to have my own apartment and, you know, be happy and have clothes and shoes that didn't have holes in them. So I was like, it's not going to happen for me in the feature film world. How long did you need away from all that before you said, okay, I'm ready to kind of like dip my toe back in the water? It was about six years. It was about six years. Um, I started to see a lot of people making short form digital content online that was really, really good. And I caught up with um, a friend and also a writer, a director named Raven Drummer out of Atlanta. And I said, hey, like, I have this really good idea for this series about these two writers who come together to make a project. But there's really something else below the surface. Would you be interested? And she said, sure. So. She put up 2,500, I put up 25, and another friend put up 25, and we made eight episode web series on $7,500. What was the web series about? Um, it was uh, Brooklyn Blue Sky, and it was about Blue and Skyler's um, journey towards creating a pilot for a Netflix and chill competition. Nice. Yes. So art imitating life and science. Art imitating yeah. life. And it made sense because she was a woman, and I, you know, I'm a man, and we were trying to make this 
um, project, but we had something underneath it. Um, I don't want to tell the story okay, of what okay. it's all about, but we had something <laughs> underneath it that needed to be further explored. And so we were able to put it in, uh, in that landscape. And, you know, thankfully everything went really, really good, better than we ever expected with that. So you almost didn't come to LA. You would have still been in New York doing plays, which doesn't sound like a bad life. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah, fun. I had no plans to move to LA <laughs> at all. Um, I was like, no, not for me. I'm gonna make it in New York and I'll never have to move to LA. But about a year ago, a little over a year ago, something, something in me just started beating and says, in order for your career to get to the next level, you have to go to LA. And I had a lot of fear because I already have, I have a beautiful life set up for me in Brooklyn. And I just, I bought a one way ticket for January 15th of 2019. And I came here and I've been here ever since and creating content and, and things have been happening. You go by your intuition, sounds like prayer. Yes, so that's what I'm letting God by, to say yes and to say no. It's by that internal, it's a muscle that you use and the more that you engage and use that muscle of listening to that internal dialogue, the easier it gets, right? So now even with hiring like a sound person, like I know like this is person I should hire, not that person. It's just something internal. And I'm still make some bad decisions. I'm not saying now everything I do is great and every decision I make is the bomb, but I'm a lot more um, aware of why I'm making decisions. I know what I'm connecting to in a person, whether it's generosity or creative, um, creative curiosity. I know what it is that I'm connecting with someone on. So it's making me a lot more purposeful and it's making my work a lot better. Which do you have a harder time with saying yes or no? Um, nowadays, it's hard. I have a much harder time saying yes because now I'm being presented with options where before everything that I was doing was just me internally doing it. But now you have, oh, you have a feature film opportunity here. You have this opportunity to direct television here. You have this opportunity here. So now I have three different things to look at in order to make that decision. And all things within context make sense. But now I'm going, what is, um, what am I truly aligned? to doing. And it's hard to look at a network and say, no, thank you. I don't want to direct your television show. Not that I don't want to direct your television show, but I'm more in line right now to do a feature film. So it's harder to make those decisions and you know what you're leaving on the table because I could make money doing that, but I'm so, but I'm guided so fiercely by my purpose. That's the thing that I move. And I only work with people. I only work with companies that I know are directly aligned with my purpose and where I'm headed. Do you have um, someone from your past, a family member, a mentor, somebody that you really um, trust guides you? I do, I do. Um, probably the closest person to me is my sister. She's been really a part of my journey from the very beginning. She's read everything that I've done. She's seen everything. She's been at all of my readings. She's been everywhere. And she knows who I am today as opposed to who I was yesterday. And so she makes sure that I continue to make decisions that I don't fall into a lot of those old pitfalls of not being able to say no or moving faster than what I need to for the sake of getting it done as opposed to getting it done correctly. And so she's able to advise me in a way that is um, that makes a lot of sense. And we laugh and we enjoy the process when we do it. And she's back home? Yeah, she's in Arkansas. Yeah, it's a lot of phone Arkansas. calls. Yeah, a lot text. of phone calls every day. Oh wow! Every day that we talk goes, every day. That's nice. mm -hmm. And then you had to reevaluate why you wanted to be in this industry, and mm -hmm. you saw that it wasn't for the reasons you thought. Or sorry, I don't mean to yeah, no, that's a hundred percent correct. I initially wanted to get into the industry because I wanted to tell stories about myself to be quite honest with you. And so if you look at a lot of my earlier work, it always is like a direct reflection of me. But as I've continued to like grow as an artist, I realized the greatest power that I have is to lend my power in agencies to telling other marginalized stories. And so I've been a person that's been fighting a good fight when I was a kid, when I was in college, and now I'm actively doing that as a storyteller. So I'm putting my lenses on stories that don't necessarily reflect me, although the journeys of these characters do reflect me, right? So like, for instance, King Esther um, is about a trans woman in New Orleans, but I'm not a trans woman, I'm not from New Orleans, but the, the human connection of needing to be seen, 
against all odds. That's where we connect. And so now I'm seeing everything doesn't have to be a reflection of myself. And so now I'm making better stories. I'm telling more um, rich characters, more flawed characters, because it's not um, any reflections of myself. And it sounds like, too, that what we talked about earlier, that character wanting to sort of validate within themselves and not have it what the world's telling them that they are. Absolutely. It's to, it's to get to that emotional, to get to that emotional truth. And that's what I'm able to tell now, um, now that I know what my emotional truth is, and that is I am a storyteller and I am worthy of telling stories that I don't necessarily own. And now I'm actively doing that and I love it. Do you feel these stories come from some other place? Yes, they all come from me. Like, I don't think there's a character that I've written that didn't reflect me in some way, shape, form, or fashion, even the ones that I really don't like. I mean, I have to admit, there are parts of myself that I just don't celebrate. You know, I don't like. I know they need to change. Um, whether that is, um, again, my ability to people please. I used to be a people pleaser. Um, and to my own detriment, I'm still actively working on that, um, that belief in self, that I'm capable of doing things that necessarily haven't been designed for me. I'm having to work on that, I'm working on my graciousness, being more gracious, more grateful, more humble each and every day for what I've been given and those people that I'm surrounded by. So as I get better and as I continue to get to my emotional truth and explore it, I'm doing that better with characters and now I'm telling better stories. And I think uh, going back to that talk that you did in Brooklyn, you had said that you're, you had to reevaluate why you wanted to be in this industry and maybe before it was being famous, and I think that's a very common thing for a lot of people why they get started, mm -hmm. especially when they're younger, and then it came down to just telling stories. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. What, what happened there? How did you, how did you, because I think it's, it's, some people, I know somebody came at me once and they said, well, how dare you say that? But that's a common thing for a lot of people. They want to mm -hmm. be famous, especially well, in this, this social media age. Absolutely, because even when I was growing up, fame um, afforded you a certain level of privilege that I wanted to have. I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted to have money. I wanted to be able to buy things. And so I knew being a young black poor boy from Arkansas, the only way I was going to get there, you got to become famous. People all have to know who you are. And I think um, there are a number of things that really like defined and refined what that experience was because it's still very much a possibility that I could become a household name and a star, but that it's not how I identify myself. You have to get away from that id and that ego and get to the intrinsic nature of who you are. And I realized that I was just brought here to create and tell stories. Right? And the manner in which I do that and how I do that is the definition of who I am. And so when I started to see that and not have a connection to physical, tangible things like a city or a house or an apartment or a couch or old pumas that needed to be thrown out, I can then approach my work so differently. There's a freedom that I have now. There's, a, there's an approach that I have now where I'm not pressed. I'm not pressed to make this decision or that decision because I know what's for me is truly is, is for me. So that was really the difference. And now that I've really been able to evaluate that, I continue to evaluate that, right? And make sure that everything that I'm doing is just aligned with the purity of telling stories and making sure that I'm doing them in the most authentic way possible. Did you used to have someone tell you stories when you were a kid? No, I used to tell the stories. <laughs> <laughs> You were Some would call them lies. <laughs> I would say stories. And I just love to entertain people through stories. Even when like I'm at dinners with friends and I'm telling a story, it's always this, this bigness to the way that I do it. But growing up, no, my mom and my, um, my stepfather were very, very, very religious, very religious people. So we were at Bible class all the time. <laughs> pretty much like six days a week, um, we were there doing that. So I didn't really have time to, they didn't have time to tell a, a whole lot of stories. So right. I mostly told stories to others. Well, there's a lot of what, parables in the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of storytelling within the Bible. There is a lot of storytelling mm -hmm. within the Bible and some of the greatest stories. I mean, a lot of my work is derived still from this, the story of Adam and Eve. It, it's an allegory that continues to come up almost in all of my work. We talked earlier about there was a time when you just got kind of stuck in this place where 
you couldn't really move, you didn't want to do this or you didn't want to do that, and you didn't know it was depression. Yep. Can you talk about what happened? Yeah, so when I started to understand what a depression was, um, the, the, the clinical definition when you really get down to it is you're unable to make a decision to move either forward or backwards, where you're really stuck in this very specific place. And so when I first moved to New York, I didn't realize that I had been going through such a depression because I wasn't able to write. I wasn't able to, I mean, a play, an essay, anything. I wasn't able to do anything. And I also wasn't able to make a decision about what my life was about to look like. And so um, when I started to deal with that, I definitely decided to get with a therapist and to start really working through the process about where I was and where I was eventually trying to go. And after being able to identify a lot of like the decisions that I was making in the present were rooted in a lot of stuff that I had done and dealt with in the past. Um, like losing my job and trying to prove to people that I had worthiness, even though something very valuable to me was actually taken away. And so one of the things that the therapist said that really began to um, transform me was one, he said, nobody is responsible for your life but you. And how you engage and get back to you is you do the things that you want to do, the things that you enjoy the things that make you happy. And through that, you will be able to kind of start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And so that's when I started to go to as much theater as I could in New York. And it was just like a sea that had been watered, you know, where it was like I was dead in my creative ability. I started to really flourish and start coming up with the ideas and started to see the definition of who I was. And there was this one specific play called Sunset Baby, um, written by Dominique Morisot, that I think really was just, it really defined me and my personal journey because she was trying to just go get on the flight and get away. And that's all I was ever trying to do was kind of get away and escape the past instead of embracing the past and using it as the fuel to create everything in the present. Just kind of what I went through and how I was able to get back on the other side. And fortunately, I haven't experienced that in a long time. Sunset Baby? Sunset Baby. And you saw that in New York? I saw that in New York at the Lab Labyrinth Theater. It was unexpected, but it was such a great piece of poetic work. It was just tremendous. Did you reach out to the playwright? No, I never did. I've never reached out. And it's uh, interesting enough because I've met other writers who know exactly who she is. Oh. Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe the universe will align and I'll be able to one day see her, look in her face and tell her, hey, this play really helped heal uh, the journey that I had internally. So did it also heal, but then you also wanted to write plays like that? Or that were affecting. And I understood that the uh, what made it so effective is that it came from a very real place inside of her. And again, I wasn't writing plays because I was trying to hide so much of who I was from the rest of the world. I wasn't able to authentically tell these really deep and rich stories. So once I started to be okay with me and who I was, I was able to go out and start really telling stories in, in a very authentic and, and rich way. And while it not, has not necessarily caught on to the popular culture, people that have been able to witness my work have been affected by it. And that's what I'm grateful for. Do you remember what it was like to leave the theater after you saw that? Like, were you in one of these dazes? I was. It was hard to get to that theater, too, because that theater <laughs> is like not by the train line. And I remember not one, not wanting to leave the theater. I didn't really want to leave the theater, so I just kind of remember sitting there for just like a, a half second longer than what I should have. And then immediately we went across the street and I just wanted to just like regurgitate and just talk about the piece and talk about the journey. And, and it's been so many amazing amazing plays that I've seen in New York. So many incredible plays and playwrights that people probably will never see their work stage, but it's an incredible group of writers and talent to pull from in New York. We often hear from people that you can't make money making films, uh, short films, feature films. Is there a way to make money from it? Or is that not, that shouldn't be your goal starting out? Well, so, I do think that you can make money from the film industry. I mean, clearly people make millions of dollars. These There are some beautiful houses in LA that was built on film money. I do think you, that you can make money from a film. I think what a lot of times um, filmmakers initially do, even with a short film, is they forget to pay themselves. And so what I've started to do, even in a line item of a, 
a film that I've invested my own money in, I still will put $1 for myself. And it's to continue to train myself to realize that I do have a monetary value that is attached to who I am and what I do. But what I think also oftentimes that filmmakers do is, and this is what they should do, whenever you're putting a budget together for a feature film, you have to also think about the life of what that film is going to be. Right. So if you're going to live with that film for six months, you also need to make sure that your expenses are covered for six months. So part of your budget when you're establishing your budget should be to have money to pay you as a director to live for those six months. Um, that's one of the things that I, techniques that I didn't do very early on. But now I actually absolutely I'm like, was well, this a two month process? I need two months of this kind of money from the budget. And so I state that up front. And also one thing that I would also say that I think filmmakers should absolutely do is say what you need as well. Right. Because we always speak from a place of just talking about the project, making sure the project we want to make sure the project has the right camera. We want to make sure it has the right light and the right location, the right actors. But the project comes from a person. So you also have to make sure you as a person has what you need to be OK as well. And so whenever I talk to filmmakers, I preach that from the very beginning. Make sure that you pay yourself as a part of the process. But as far as the film's um, ability to be monetized and to make money, there are people whose job is to do that. And you should go find those people and make sure that you get in contact with those people to make that happen. Because it's not our job to make the money. It's our job to create the product. And make the money after it's out or get paid up front? Well, I think a filmmaker should definitely get paid up front for their fees. I think they should also negotiate um, some type of ownership in the project as well. However, whatever you get initially, whatever that initial sale is on your film is all the money that you will get. Like period, point blank. I have not heard of a film doing amazing at the box office and then a filmmaker making millions with certain level of ownership. So you also have to come at it from a very realistic place as well. Um, so that's what I would advise somebody to do get you should be a line item in the budget. You should own some of your product, but that initial sale, you should benefit from that as well. That initial distribution sale. That's where you're going to get your money. You're not going to get no more money after that. Can you give us some examples of ways you've been able to make money with films or stage plays? Sure. So uh, primarily how I've been able to make my money over the past three years have been in short form digital content. And so one of the ways that you can do it is you figure out what networks are actually looking for uh, from time frame to um, um, what specifically has to be inside the frame. And so I end up making Brooklyn Blue Sky for about um, $7,500. I got another small investment on the back end to do some editing. And then I was able to send those projects over to BET as I knew BET was starting to look for um, digital content because we were initially going to just put it on the internet. But we started working with this producer named Chris Hicks and he was like, no, like BET is actively looking for content. So we were able to license the content at uh, a pretty nice rate per episode. And so that was able to pay the budget back. But then because I had ownership in the series, I was able to use that money to live off of for an entire year. Um, I also was able to do that with Sauce, um, the project with that as well, except they gave us a big budget from the very beginning and we negotiated a larger budget. And then we just held some of that money back for me to actually get paid in order to do what I needed to do um, later on down the line. So if you make a project for a little bit amount of money, but you're able to get a larger licensing fee, that'll be able to give you some actual um, revenue that you're able to, to create along the way. So mostly it's been short form content. It's been short form content because people are looking to fill up those content avenues and the content arenas. Also, I've been able to start working recently, start working with different brands who are looking to create content as well, short form digital content, because that's, of course, my specialty. And from that, you can also make money as well, because a lot of brands are looking for their stories to be told in a very linear digital way. And so you're able to utilize that as well. Different brands work with them in order to create stories. And um, you can make money off that as well. 
And did those brands approach you or you were already working with someone who was working with those brands? So I actually approached the brands, believe it or not. Um, sometimes an empty mouth just doesn't get fed. So I would put together a small package. Um, I did it for a wine company. I did it for another um, um, liquor company. I said, hey, I make short form content. This is what my views have been. Um, combined with your talent and your resources, it could be much more. And this is a story idea that I have for you. And here's how we would do it. And this is what it would look like. And two of those brands um, picked up on it. And that's another way that I'm able to use my storytelling abilities in order to, um, to make money. And did you research which brands you should go after? Did you say, I think I would be right for this one or? So with um, one liquor brand, I had a friend that worked in that field. So I already had a direct connect. And then the other one was a connect through uh, a manager that I had, and she was able to connect me over to them and I was able to pitch it. But I know in the next year or so, that's when I'll be working on a little bit more. That'll be a separate side of my production company where we actually really start to churn those different types of projects out. And um, how do you contact those people? Do you send an email, like oh, just a quick pitch? Or? Mm -hmm. You can do uh, a quick pitch. A lot of times a deck, some type of visual deck for them to be able to see really works. A lot of times people don't know what they want until they actually, you show them what they want and then it makes sense. And also you're able to create something at a much lower price point than you, they're able to make commercials at. So they look at you and they're like, oh, this only costs 250,000. We get eight episodes at 10 minutes apiece, as opposed to them putting $1.2 million into a commercial that's 30 seconds long. And so it is an attractive um, bid for a brand to be able to create content because they have the budgets to be able to put more content and everybody's into storytelling right now. So they have the money to be able to put those things out there. And so are you, once you have the budget, then you're finding the talent or they already have people in mind? So I manage the projects as, as they're my own projects. Um, with taking advisement from them. A lot of times brands don't necessarily have talent because it's a very new thing to use brands in order to tell stories. So it could be a story about a guy who needs to find his dog and the brand could be about dog food. So yeah, they may have like an idea or two, but most of the time for me, what I've seen is they just allow me to go out there and to procure the talent to create and to make the production. When you return to filmmaking, what changed for you? My perspective changed. My perspective on what I wanted and how I wanted to get there, it really, really, really changed. I didn't now look at it as an opportunity for me to become famous or a star, but rather for me to intrinsically tell really, really great stories. And because my approach changed, so did my attitude. So then I could just enjoy it for what it was. And I could send it to Sundance and if Sundance says, no, I'm like, it's no problem. I still made a great project. You know, where is it supposed to go? And then it gets into this film festival. I'm like, that's where it was supposed to be. So my perspective really changed because it was it no longer became about the money or the fame or any of that. It came purely about my connection with the audience. And if they're if I'm able to successfully get them to see the story that I need them to see, then I was a success. And that's where I see success now. I think I heard you say something. And I love this. You said, the way I wrote this down, you said you just do it straight Dewey. And, and what, what is that? That's great. I, I just do it my way. <laughs> I do it my way. On set, I make sure every, I know everybody's name. Um, when I'm um, out at film festivals, I wait to shake the very last hand. Like I'm doing everything the way that Dewey does it. And I'm only working with people who are kind of just giving me the space to just do my Dewey thing. You know, which I'm jovial. Um, I'm, I'm, open, I'm very focused on what I'm doing, yet I have a, a very nuanced perspective on this industry and on you know my creative approach. So I'm just doing it the way that I do it and I don't worry about any other creators or how they do their thing or what they have or what they don't have. So just do the Dewey. I just, just do the Dewey. I like it. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you feel that growing up? It was okay to be you? No, not at all. I grew up in a town where I really felt, I felt so small. I felt so different. It was a town of people who didn't reflect any of the experience that I'd had or had known. And I always felt like I was fighting to be seen. Um, 
and I was always out the way that I saw the world wasn't reflective on the environment that I was seeing. So I didn't feel that it was okay for me to be who my most authentic self was. And I think after my first feature film and me moving to New York and just being in this environment of creative people who are just being authentic and like me seeing like it is okay to be myself. It is okay for me to to, to love everybody. It's okay for me to look at the world uh, from an international place as opposed to just being a domestic place. It's okay. So when I started to give myself the permission to experience myself in the fullness of who I was, that's when everything really started to change. And I'm like, you know what? This is who I am. This is how I am. This is the kindness that I have to give. I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna keep creating, keep, keep it moving. And that's how I work. And how did life change for you? Everything has magnified. So I remember when I moved to New York, I had um, 60 bucks, I had two bags, that's all I had. Um, I had lost my furniture, I had lost my cars, I had, I had lost all of the things that I thought defined who I was. And then I remember just using my universal intuition to be able to see how I was gonna move forward with certain things, whether I should do this play, whether I should do this short film, whether I should work on this music video. And then slowly I started to see all the things that I had lost came right back. I got a bed and I got a, a car and I got a couch and I had this and my appreciation for it was so different while still not being attached to any of it at all. Right, I could lose everything tomorrow and I'll still be Dewey Gerard, right? And I'm still gonna be kind and I'm still gonna create and I'm still gonna have purpose because it's not defined by what I have, it's defined by who I am. And that's how I kind of have lived my life since then. Did you approach Issa Rae about King Esther or did she approach you? Uh, the producer, Caroline Robinson, she had approached Denise Davis over there who was kind of, um, um, Issa's right hand. And so we they were the first people that we had connected with about uh, King Esther. But at the time, it just they were trying to do some new things digitally. We hadn't really gotten out on the film festival circuit. And so we just kind of had a meeting of the minds. And so it was nice that when it came back around and we had looked at all the options on the table, we chose the option that we had kind of found from the very beginning, which was Issa Rae's uh, production company. And sorry, it was already finished? It was already finished, already yeah. Finished. So it was okay. finished we, we, even when we initially caught up with them. We had sent them the version of King Esther, and they really, really loved it and saw um, the value of it, but they weren't ready to like release on their network or anything like that at that time. And then when we came back later, everything was just beautifully aligned for, for, the, for the both of us to work together on it. And King Esther is about what? So King Esther is a short form digital con um, series about a transgender woman in New Orleans seven days before Hurricane Katrina and her decision to either stay or leave as the, as the hurricane comes to town. Yeah, so each episode is for one day in her life uh, leading up to August 28, 2005. And do people know that she's trans or? Yes, so she is um, noticeably, she's noticeably trans in this series. And um, as it's a part of the series, it's, it doesn't encapsulate what this series is all about. It could have been about any character, but it's just about Esther who just so happens to be trans. Sure. But it's nice for us to be able to kind of also have explored her and her journey a little bit as, um, as well and how she was gonna get there. But it has all the elements of family discomfort, love, belonging, seeing, dreams. It's all, it's all woven in there inside the story. And you wrote it? Yeah, I wrote it. I wrote it, directed it, produced it. So, What made you want to write it? Um, I had written a play called The Inevitable Sadness of All Things Good, which was actually about her brother. And so um, there came this, this time where I would do different readings for it in Brooklyn. And people always loved the piece, but they really liked Esther, but they knew that authentically she wasn't where she needed to be. And so to really to really exercise myself in telling stories of 
people who don't belong, you know, necessarily to the same experience that I've had, I started to just etch out her story and I started to write it and I started to do an incredible amount of research about the trans um, community, uh, their stories, their journeys, their authenticity, the way that they live and the fullness of themselves. And then I just encapsulated all of that into this story where the common denominator across all was the humanity and empathy. And that's how I made the story. Has anyone reached out to you about it? Yes, so we've had um, people from Sundance to reach out. We've had networks reach out. We've had a lot of people. It's been a lot of movement on this series, which is really, really exciting because it, it is a series that people, and it tells a story that's something that people really haven't seen. So it's nice to see people, you know, so active about that. And it was nice to have options on the table before we just us deciding to go with um, Easter Ray and Color Creative Presents. Do you think if you had written it 15 years earlier, it would have the same, you know, because now there, it feels like there's way more acceptance. Yeah. Whereas you know, people have been trans for years, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, I would mm -hmm. see people all the time, but it was definitely not accepted yeah. except within small circles. But do you think now it, it has way more of a life to it? Yes, I think the normalization of us recognizing that gender is not monolithic, that there's different ways that people are being able to approach gender. Um, and the openness to that is what has given way to her success. But I don't think that had I done this back in, you know, 2000 and, um, that it would five or anything right. like that, it would have had the same gravitas that it had now. I think it would be probably would have had a little bit of more of a cult following. So people would have watched it, you know, in the cover of darkness, but it wouldn't have been able to be what it is now. I think now was the perfect time, especially on the heels of her story of um, Pose and other things that continue to introduce new and different and stories to the fold. Where does the money come from for a web series? Like with King Esther. So money could come from a couple different places as far as an S, um, like a, a short form digital content series. A lot of brands are beginning to engage and do their own short form content. Uh, Quibi has that. Um, every major network has a short form digital content arm. New Form specializes in short form digital content. Essex, Essence. A magazine just started a Essence Digital Studio. So they're, it, they're there and they're funding content in order for um, stories to have a life online. But also, so that's one way you can get funding, but also we went the way of, we went, we went private equity. So I invested money into King Esther, Caroline Robinson invested money, um, Brian Robertson, he invested money. So we had people, John Mallow, that came together and we funded it together. Also another incredible tool is um, crowdfunding. A lot of people are beginning to utilize that as well in order to get in the short form digital content space. And the only advantage that I really see of short form digital content is that it can be licensed. So you can make content and if you make it for an inexpensive cost, it can be licensed for someone else to be able to pick up and to utilize. So you can monetize those efforts. So when you approached these different people to be investors, had you already written the script or you told them that you would do this, what, spoken word or, or this play and people really liked this one character? Right. So um, one thing I know about raising money that you, in order to really raise money in an appropriate way, if you don't have a household name, is you already have to have the product ready to go. And you have to have some type of creative, um, proven track record to go along with that. So people saw the success that I had with BET and Brooklyn Blue Sky. So then it was a much easier introduction to say, hey, here is my other piece of content that I would like to do next. And again, when after I did that, I was able to walk into Brick and say, this is what I would like to do. And it was a full funded effort from a production company. So was, you have to make these different investments and hopefully the next time I do it, I have even more money to really create the resources and things that I need to do to film the way that I need to film. So you just have to kind of create this little bit of a track record, but the script was the one thing that people that needed to see in order for them to make that investment um, tangible. And you said, so it was already, how many episodes was it, seven? Seven episodes. Mm -hmm. They were already written when I um, sent it out to for people to make an investment inside of it. Did anybody try to say, can we just tweak this one part? Can we make this not too noticeable? Can we not touch on this topic too much? Or did they say the opposite? It needs to be more in your face. They were so open to the way I wanted to create. And that is the beauty of 
people trusting in your vision. And if you don't prove that from the beginning and people don't trust you, they, they, then they do hit you with notes. They do say, hey, this is how I would like to see this because they've never seen you execute. But because I'd executed a, a, a really well done, well crafted product and people read the script and saw the, the dearth of what I had kind of put together, they had all the trust in the world. Like this is exactly what it was supposed to be. It was also really nice for us to send it out to a lot of trans organizations to make sure that they could put their eyes on it and make sure that the experience that Esther was having was absolutely authentic. And, and they agreed? They agreed. Everybody loved Esther. Everybody loves them some Esther. <laughs> so it's been nice. Even in the release of it, it's been really, really nice. And just to see so many people support a story um, that needed to be supported. Did you know King Esther was going to be released on Issa Rae's channel during the screenwriting process? I did not know that. I had no, I didn't even think it was going to be possible, to be honest with you, because she has so many fantastic productions and so many people are reaching out to them and their team to get access to their platform because of what it's able to do to transform your career. So I just really wrote it from a place of authenticity and then it was just nice to be on the other end and just see this is the path that was laid and designed for it. But I had no idea, none. What's that process like once you finally sort of get an email yes or maybe how does that work? Sure. So once somebody like a, um, Issa Rae Presents says, yes, we want to take your series, then they have to make sure that you have a really strong ch chain of title. So they need all like the documentation that goes with saying that this is absolutely your production and that there's no type of copyright infringement that kind of exists within the context of the series. But we also were able to use fair usage um, licensing because it was a series that is really saying something more. It's not just purely entertainment value. It also has a lot of educational components to it as well. So then we got there, then we had to put together a partnership agreement. We had a lot of meetings to discuss the approach, how we wanted to release, how we wanted to give gain access and traction. We would come visit that kind of in the middle of the series and we just kind of put it all together. And then October 17th, we released the series and then every Thursday after we were just able to put it out. So that's how the process went. And what time frame is that? So it took us about two months. Two months from the time that they said yes, because the production was already ready to go. Since we already had all of our paperwork together, we already had our book, we already had our chain of title, we didn't have to go make any of those things happen, which is, again, the advantage of professionalism and knowing this is what you need in order to get this deal um, secured. So it was about a two month process and, and everything happened really fast, everything happened really quick. and. Before we knew it, it was like out. It was like, what? You know, and it did really, really good. What do you think people get wrong with wanting to do a web series? Are you think they're writing for the market instead of how you said you didn't know, so you're just writing a story that you want to tell based on the feedback you were getting? Right. I think what happens a lot of times, um, most of the, the digital series that I see are usually actors who want to showcase themselves inside of a, a, a series, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what happens when everything is a direct reflection of you, some of the rigorous approach that you need to take to some of the flaws that the character may have, or even some of the performance that an actor may give, gets lost because the series is 100% about them, right? So I think what really uh, unlocks a little bit of magic in you and to not make it so personal and to make it more objective is to be able to tell a story that necessarily you don't own. Maybe an experience that you had, but it's not necessarily about you as a creator. And also, we've seen so many friends in an apartment <laughs> living together, talking about life. We've seen so many of these things. So I think the freshness of King Esther was that not only was it a digital series, but it was a new approach. It's like, oh, this is one day. And it was there was some dark, very dark elements to the series. So to see something that they have not seen before allowed people to kind of hang on to the series a little bit more. Because, uh, you know, people quickly move past you on, um, on the internet. <laughs> right. I like that. Yeah, you're right. There have been a lot of friends in apartments. 
Where were you when it went live? So we were at the New Orleans Film Festival. So we made the product in New Orleans. We love the New Orleans Film Festival. We wanted to one day possibly get in, and we actually got into the festival, and we decided to release it the day after the screening. So oh, wow. we were in New Orleans, and we were having a big party when it was online, and everybody was seeing it. Wow. Yeah, it was it was so serendipitous, and it was it could have been more perfect. And so did you reflect in that moment, like, this all that I went through, yes. if, if this is what I had, I think this is worth it. Yes, it made it, it made it all worth it. All the cast were able to come back to New Orleans and be there. And just to see how full of circles some things come, we could have never designed it more perfectly than what it was able, than how it was able to happen. And it was nice to be able to be there, be inspired, breathe the same air, eat the same food, which I gained a lot of weight <laughs> that week, but it was all worth it because I think New Orleans is such a special and unique um, city that has given so much to me. So it was so nice to be there as we released our series. You went to college there? I went to school in um, Louisiana. So I went oh. to, in Baton Rouge, I went to LSU and then moved to New Orleans right after, right after I finished. What is it that's so special? I've never been there. I've always wanted to go, but what is it that, that's so special? So there's a culture that, um, and an ownership of that culture that the people have that just, you know when someone loves their city and they treat it with that same love and respect and that dignity. And it's a city that's kind of unlike American cities where tradition is king. And so everything that they do has a traditional element to it from the second lines to Mardi Gras and how they have the people in the city actually have the Mardi Gras experience to how they eat food on Sundays in these really big pots and you know so it's 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 a it's a culture that's steeped in traditions to to be able to participate and understand those traditions is what makes it so special and um, I don't think there's any city in the in the world quite like New Orleans and after Hurricane Katrina did you notice changes in how the community came together mm -hmm. or? Yeah, so it was really interesting. So I was there before and after Hurricane Katrina. I moved back maybe a, a year and a half afterwards. And in a lot of ways, it was it had this very like um, darkness to it. I mean, all the lights weren't on in the city when I got back. Um, the grounds, the median wasn't being cut on a regular basis when I got back. It was still very much a city that was in peril and in the stage of rebuilding. Um, now you're able to see a lot of the gentrification that has taken place and a lot of the residents that were in New Orleans that had never left. Actually, when they got out, they never came back. And so you see the city in a different way than I saw the city prior to August 28, 2005. But there's still, there's just still really beautiful element. The people have, some of the people have moved back and have continued to maintain those traditions that have been able to continue to make the city um, extremely special. So some of that is gone because of gentrification and some of it's gone. I mean, some of the history was washed away in the storm. Um, I mean, when you just really think about um, some of the evidence that was needed for like uh, legal fights and battles were gone, um, lives were lost through that process, homes were forever destroyed and not rebuilt. So the city is completely transformed as opposed to what it was prior to, but the spirit of the city is the same. And it's, um, it's beautiful to see that they've had the resurgence and that they're doing well, and it's still as beautiful as it was before. Do you almost consider that more your home? I don't actually. <laughs> I love New Orleans, <laughs> but I struggled. Okay. Woo! I had such a hard time when I was living in New Orleans. Um, I didn't have any money. It was very hard for me to find a job, very hard for me to get anything. All I had was enough money to get a dollar and 14 cents muffin to be able to write in the CC's coffee house every day that I was writing in. And all I did was just write every single day because I didn't, um, it kept down the hunger pains, to be quite honest with you. And it kept me distracted from the reality of life that I was actually having. It was very, very tough because uh, I was young and trying to make something out of nothing in a city that wasn't um, uh, an environment that could cultivate my career. And so it was very, very difficult. And while I love New Orleans, I don't see it as like my home. I, I feel like much more of a New Yorker. Oh, OK. Yeah, much more of a New Yorker. Mm. I felt at home from the first day. I love New York. With creating content that you wanted to create, working with Issa Rae, 
did you feel you were finally where you wanted to be? Yes, I feel like that's where I was supposed to be. Um, that's why we made the decision to go with Issa Rae Presents and the Color Creative um, YouTube channel because we knew that there was an audience that was there that was specifically for us. And Issa Rae and Denise make sure that they allow voices to be, to, to be the voice that they are. They didn't ask us to change anything. They just wanted to amplify the voice that a perspective that we had already given. So it was just so nice to be at a place that didn't ask you to change anything. So you could just be Dewey? You yeah, I could just do my Dewey thing. Yeah. That's the kind of environments that I look for. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and is that part of like sort of the test as to where you want to be or what you want to do is, do I feel like I can be me and I'm not being controlled into being someone else? Right. Yes, that is that is an important component to me being able to flourish as a filmmaker, while yet still being able to accept and work with others in order to make my work better. Because it's still a very collaborative effort to creating a film product. You can't do it on your own. It's impossible. But to be able to do it the way that I see myself being able to do it. I mean, you can have a Starbucks or you can have CC's Coffee House. They're not going to do coffee the same way but you can still enjoy the cup. Sure. And so yeah. it's the same way with me. It's like, you can enjoy my product, but you can also enjoy the process of doing it as well. Making sure people get lunch breaks, making sure people feel seen, making sure people feel heard in a way that a lot of sets don't necessarily run themselves. And so I get it. Um, it's just the way that I do things and it's my approach to storytelling. Because I want it to feel authentic behind the camera and in front of the camera as well. What does filmmaking give you that you don't get anywhere else? Joy, a, pure, a pureness in the joy. And it gives me a focus that I don't have anywhere else in my life. Like, in a lot of ways, my actual life is a mess. <laughs> but my film career is okay, you know, cause it just, I have a focus. Like I can wake up in the morning and know like, this is the story that I'm telling. And I get to collaborate with other beings and other creative souls and entities who are trying to get to somewhere creative as well. It gives me such pleasure and such joy to be able to do that and to be able to define it as a career. Because it wasn't a career when I first started. It was a, a, a desire. It was a goal, but it wasn't a career. And now I'm comfortably in a place where it's a career for me and I'm actually being paid to write screenplays or to put together productions for um, for brands, and it's really, really nice to be able to do that. What's your advice to someone that um, is in a small town that's creative, maybe they don't feel like they fit in, they love people there, but they wanna break out? Yeah, I, I get it, I get it. I was there for a really long time, and the reality is, is at some point you will have to get out, depending on whatever your eventual goal and your desire is but to create where you are. Um, when I first moved to New Orleans and made my first short film, I wasn't in LA, but it mattered, right? It gave me the skills that I needed to put together a team and to lead that team. Um, I did a good 10 other films in Louisiana before I made my feature film. And I did that in Atlanta, Georgia, you know? And so it's just, you know, where you are, create where you are, because you're going to need those skills as you move further and further along down the line. Um, one thing that I do see difficult, and I, and I, and I identify with uh, a lot of these people who go to film school, where the, the process is set up for you. It's told, you know, you don't have to go find a script supervisor. There's somebody that's there that's gonna be a script supervisor. And so when they get out and get into the real world, they really struggle because the um, foundation to create is not established for them. They have to go make it happen for themselves. So creators like myself who have that fortitude to just get out and make it happen, it'll give you a competitive advantage when you actually get into the real world because this is how you actually have to put it together. You gotta barter, you gotta work with people, you gotta have people intelligence. You have to have all those things in order to just get your work out in the most um, nuanced way that you possibly can. Do you think there's a danger to being a creator in a small town? I do think that it doesn't have its advantages. So one thing about being in a small town is you're not gonna, your crew is not gonna be as nearly as talented as what you would like them to be. Um, I mean, just a first AC, you don't think about how 
much of first AC matters until you're in a situation where a first AC saves your production, right? A script supervisor. A lot. So in a in a lot of those small towns, you don't have access to those resources to be able to put it together at a very high level. But again, once you're able to put a film together and you have to be smart and savvy about putting it together without a script supervisor, when you get a script supervisor, you're like, oof. I'm living a good life. <laughs> you make a film without a monitor. You like, I don't even know how I miss this, miss that, and the other until you get a monitor. You're like, oh, I'm living a good life. So for me, everything that I get, I feel like I'm in Disney World now. I'm like, oh, I have two ACs in this film department. Like, let's go. You know, where before you're training in person on how to hold the boom mic properly. And so those are the disadvantages, but it's such a refining of you as a filmmaker. And it's a necessary lesson that you will be able to carry all the way up to an HBO production. Do you think it's dangerous for a creator to be in a small town and create the backlash sometimes? Um, I think it depends on what the creator is saying. If the creator is really moving the, net, the, the needle forward in a dark place, there probably could necessarily be some backlash or they're doing subject matter that is you know, not, um, socially acceptable, whatever their society may be. So there could be some dangers, but the beautiful thing is the internet really just levels the playing field because now you can find an audience. Even if it's not directly where you are, you can find an audience to connect with your work. And I mean, whether that's a comedy or whether it's a, a really, it's a horror, you can find your audience. And so the internet is able to accomplish a lot of those disadvantages that small towns kind of give you nowadays. One of your quotes on your website is about surrounding yourself with certain types of creatives. And there's like three qualities. Mm -hmm. What are those qualities and why do they matter to you? Mm. So the three qualities that just really make the difference for me in working with someone is generosity, it is intellectual curiosity and accountability. And what I had found in my career was where are the pitfalls that I'm kind of running into. Sometimes you would work with someone and a decision would be made and nobody would want to be accountable for that. Well, I don't want to work with people who don't engage in being accountable because accountable just means you take a responsibility for the decision that you made. And then one of the things that I am just by nature is I'm a very generous person. And so I want to work with other creators who are just as generous because if you're able to give to each other, then that gives everybody more to be able to hold on to. And I also have, when I'm making something or I'm constructing a narrative or I'm getting stuck on a shot list or how I want to approach it, I find that intellectual vigor or intellectual curiosity is really the thing that solves the problem. Like how we as a team can come together to overcome it, to make the best decision possible that's going to assist this story. And so those are the, those are the things that I need. And they, they work beautifully when you're able to have that cohesive team on set. And I think it's always just reflected beautifully in the, um, the final product. When should an artist quit their day job? I honestly think an artist should quit their day job under two circumstances. When the day job is either inhibiting your ability to create your art, or when you have found the financial resources to be able to live comfortably within your art. Um, that happened for me a year ago. I had a job for some time, and I just, I said this is keeping me from being able to really engage in, and do my art. And so I left it. It was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made as opposed to how I went the first time. Because <laughs> it was more on my terms and it mattered to me to be able to just create art full time. So I think those are the two circumstances that identify when you should actually leave your job. Yeah, it must be really empowering to know that you, you saw the force, to, you did it on your own. Yes. It wasn't where somebody was pushing you out or you felt you had to like hang on. You right. took that sort of Right. And I was no more prepared, to be quite honest with you. It wasn't like I had saved this, you know, incredible amount of money to be able to live for like a year. None of those things happened. But I just knew my heart was telling me that it was time to go. And so I unlocked that fear. I walked through it and I was so happy that I did because right on the other side, I was able to get a job that really paid a 
you know, a fair amount of money for maybe to live on for some time. And I'm continuing to see different opportunities to just arise to say, hey, and it's just kind of carrying me forward. So it was the right decision to make, and I'm glad that I made it. What was the worst year you had as a filmmaker? The year, the worst year I had as a filmmaker was definitely the year after I created Lesson Before Love. Um, it just, the difficulty of holding this production in my hand because it's my child. And I sometimes will always say it was like having a child before I was ready to have a child because you still have to get this child ready. You have to put this child on his feet and send it to a film festival or you have to do this. And so I had all these accountabilities and responsibilities towards this film project, but I didn't even have the personal resources to take care of myself. And so it was an extremely, extremely dark year for me. A lot of times I kind of don't even really want to reflect on it because of how difficult it was to know that you have this really good product, but you don't even have the resources to eat that day, but you got to edit. So editing on an empty stomach is incredibly difficult. It's not inspired editing. You know, you're just trying to get through it. And we made so many mistakes on that project and we lost, um, we did, we lost so much along the process, but we did the absolute best you could do with $45,000. <laughs> like, and that's why I'm so proud of that project because it's like, ah, I mean, what I was able to accomplish with nothing was remarkable, but it was a very, very dark time. When did it turn around for you? It didn't turn around for like another year and a half after I made that production. Um, and it had nothing to do with the production. It started to, I started to take care of myself. And so I was like, I need a job, you know, I needed to get an apartment. I needed to do the things that I needed to do for my mental health. And so I started to do those things. I'm exercising regularly, eating better, um, actually hanging out, engaging in meeting people and, you know, just all the things that I needed to be doing, not stuck in a lab, just edited in a film. So it was a lot on the other side of that. And that's why I thought it was going to be impossible for me to go back there because it was so much pain when I was there. And so now as I'm approaching doing my next feature film again, I just hope and trust that it will be different this time around. And you like to write in noisy, loud coffee shops? I do. I do. And believe it or not, I'm able to focus because it's like so much going on around me. I'm like, ah, no, stay here, as opposed to being home and just sitting and thinking like, oh, I wonder who wrote Downtown Abbey and then looking it up online, <laughs> you know? So it just gives me a different kind of like focus to be able to just write in a, um, in a busy environment. It just makes sense for me for whatever reason. Do people ever try to talk to you and ask you, what are you doing? And Yeah, I engage in coffee talk. I'm cool with coffee talk. You know, the coffee talk doesn't really bother me. Um, what I find, though, is a lot, there's a lot of very respectful creators out here because everybody's trying to create, even people that have successfully done it, everybody's still trying to create. So it's nice to be able to work with different people who still respect the process. And we call them like um, writing dates. So I just meet up with other creatives and we'll we'll write together for like eight hours and we'll just call it like a writing date. And, you know, we'll engage a conversation here and there. But yeah, we do. Yeah, there is something um, interesting about being in a busy space mm -hmm. because you can almost tune out some of that stuff, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it it keeps you, I don't know, there's a different energy to it. Yeah, it is. And I feel like sometimes it, it, some people should give it a try, whereas in the past maybe you think that too much chaos is not good. It actually can be invigorating. It, it really can be in a lot of ways. So I agree with you 100%. Yeah, and you see some interesting stuff happen in those mm -hmm. coffee shops. You do. <laughs> and they might end up in your story. They, <laughs> and they have. <laughs>
it's um, my take on religious dogma and um, dreams and the reality in the landscape of devastation. Is he a new person to the town? No, so oh. he's been in New Orleans for a long time. He's a Pigeon Town dude. And um, he, he was introduced in King Esther. You actually saw him in the actual series um, numerous times, but this time it's really just his own journey. Hmm. And what are your, um, what are you feeling about this project? I'm scared. I'm really scared to be quite honest with you. I've, now I know. Right, I can't unknow how difficult it is to do a feature film, and so one of the things that I've been doing lately is um, f letting go of the fear from the past, and also not being anxiety anxiety about the future, but just being present and enjoying the present. Because in the present, I'm okay, right? And so I'm really trying to work through that fear and all of what I had to go through with the first feature, because. It wasn't pleasant, and I don't want to have to go through it again. Um, but I recognize um, one of the agreements that you have to make with these films is you have to live with it no matter what, so it might happen again, right? I may lose everything again. And to face that risk um, in the landscape of this story that I feel like is necessary to be told is what has me fearful, but it's also is, is fueling me in order to do it and hopefully do it better than I did my first feature film the first time. You know that saying that like if, if someone was able to do something the first time that even if they lose everything, most likely they can do it again mm -hmm. because they kind of did it on their own. It yeah. wasn't like someone just totally helping them. So yeah. do, do you have any of that feeling like maybe even if things go south that you can still do something else? Yeah, yeah. I, I realized no, no matter what I lost that I was still me without it. And so it's not the things that I'm afraid of. It's not, you know, the spoils, because like I said, I, I lost them and I've been so blessed to get it all back. And so I'm not afraid of losing it again. But what I lost um, was a sense of self. And that's what I don't want to lose um, this time around. I still want to maintain my joy. I still want to maintain my desire to create film. Because I feel like if I have another experience like I had the first time, it might break me and I don't want to stop making films. And so there's a lot of fear there. But at the same time, I think I really I'm surrounded by really good people. I've had these experiences. I've gone there before and I know I'll be OK in the end. And why do you want to attempt to go through this again? Well, personally, uh, especially in recent years, I've had a lot of questions about religion. Um, and the effects of it and where I am personally as it pertains to my own spiritual and religious journey. And so King's story has such a universal component of uh, spirituality and religion with inside of it that I just think that it's, it's the story that I have to tell in order to heal that part of myself that really needs that healing and that needs that confirmation that where I am religious wise is where I'm supposed to be. So it's a really, a, um, it's, it's going to be a challenge to be able to unlock that magic. But I think that that's there. And hopefully, you know, um, this film could support a really beautiful thesis of why we still engage and have religion. Would you say it's faith based? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Oh, no, no, no. It's not faith-based, but that's the idea because it is faith-based because King is absolutely stepping out on faith. But it's not, um, it's not a religious film that's about God as we know God to be. It's about his experience of God and his approach to how we should experience God. And so I think there's some fascinating elements to it. Uh, there's some beautiful imagery that I've already been able to encapsulate in this side of my mind. And so hopefully I'm able to unlock this in the fullness of how I'm dreaming it up. And hopefully it's effective. And it's a really effective um, story that people are participating in. Do you think people feel ashamed for wanting to do films questioning faith, religion? I think it's a, Questioning faith and religion is, is one of those no-nos, especially in the black community. You know, we're all, a lot of us, especially from the South, are raised in the throes of religion while not ever challenging 
that religion. And so for me, I have a lot of challenges for religion. And so I think seeing this trend to other people questioning it as well will really lend itself to being able to engage and have this narrative. Because I don't think God is who we have made him out to be. And so I really want to challenge just even our own personal view of who God is and who God can be inside of. Your best year as a filmmaker? It would have to be 2019. Okay. Yes, because I feel like I made my best work, which has been King Esther, and I've been able to move to LA. I have not been destroyed by it. I've been comforted by it, actually. I'm healthy, I'm strong, and I feel like I have more creative vigor than I've ever had before. So I'm really excited. This 2019 has been an amazing year for me, and I'm really grateful for it. And that was one thing you said too that you've worked on on gratitude. And yes, that's something that and you... I and I unlock that gratitude every day, all the time. Make sure when I am having a negative thought or I'm having a thought that is debilitating to who I am, to uh, to reverse that by making sure I give gratitude because there's so much more for me to be grateful for than things for me to be sad about. And so I try to make sure I unlock that at every waking turn um, through my creative journey. At what point did things start going right for you? When I let go of who I thought I should be and embraced who I authentically am. That has been the difference. Um, had I still in, engaged in that level of fear that I had from Lesson Before Love, I never would have made Brooklyn Blue Sky. But I'm like, this is what I was supposed to make and this is why. And it's been the difference. I was able to let go of all that past and just embrace the present. And I think that's been the difference. And, and, and celebrate who you are. And celebrate like who said, I am. Celebrate my perspective mm -hmm. and celebrate my successes. Because I think sometimes as filmmakers, we get so caught up in what the film hasn't done, we fail to unlock gratitude for what the film is doing. And even if it's affecting one person, right, even if it only got into the Chicago International Film Festival, it got there. And that's something to be grateful for. And now that's how I live.